Yeah, thanks for having me. I'll skip the intro. I mean, I guess obligatory um, branding is, you know, I'm, I'm the founder of Variant Fund and, and we invest in early stage startups. And I'll talk more about that at the end. I have a lot of slides because there's just so much happening um, in, in NFT world. Um, so I'll, I'll just dive straight into it. Okay, cool. So this presentation is called NFT, what the fuck? Because there's just, there's just so much happening. Um, I'll start with a brief definition of like, you know, sort of my, my sort of summary definition of what NFTs are. Um, and then we'll get into sort of what's happening out there. Um, and then hopefully at the end, there will, there'll be time for questions because I'm sure what I'm about to show you is going to prompt a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. Um, okay. So first, what are NFTs? Um, I'm going to throw out a definition that is technically incorrect, but like a good metaphor um, for explaining them to, to people who, who are new. Um, so I think a, sim a very simple way to think about NFTs, and again, this is technically incorrect, um, is that they are files that live on the blockchain. So what does that mean? It means, well, like a Bitcoin that you know, lives on the Bitcoin blockchain, is a digital sort of representation of a thing that can't be copy pasted, edited, deleted, or otherwise manipulated. That's why you know Bitcoin is able to retain value. If I were able to copy and paste your Bitcoin, it wouldn't be valuable at all, right? So, a a sort of metaphorical definition for NFTs is that they're files that live on the blockchain, meaning you can't copy or paste them. You can't edit or delete this representation of a thing on on the chain. Um, so why does that matter? Um, it matters because it makes it possible to own a piece of the internet or to own a piece of digital media, a file of any kind, a JPEG, an, an image, a video, a song, a 3D render, um, an essay. You can own that file in the same way that you can own a digital currency asset like Bitcoin. And that's important because it's the exact opposite of the way that media distribution um, has worked in the Web2 era. So, so think about the fact that every single day, billions of media files are shared on the internet, on social media. And when those files um, you know, go from your phone or your computer onto Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, whatever, um, what's actually happening is a copy of the file, the copy of the media file is taken from your device and paste it onto the server of the platform that's distributing it. And that's not all that happens. In addition to copying the file, you're also copying the right to use the file and monetize the file as the platform sees its fit. And that's because somewhere along the way, you, you signed a terms of service agreement that lets the platform um, sort of do what they want, run ads against it, um, give you whatever revenue split they see fit. Um, but crypto changes this. Because if you can upload a file to the blockchain, that means you can own it and people can interact with it in the same way you can interact with you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum, which is directly peer-to-peer -peer without any platform intermediating the transaction. And if that's true, it stands to reason that the creators of these digital media files who are uploading their files to the blockchain will be able to capture more of the value they create directly without the platform standing in the way. So that's the big idea with NFTs is that we now have a way to represent a digital file to own it and for the creators of that digital file to capture more of the value they create online. Um, and that's why I think NFTs are going to become the port of entry for all internet media. It's not just you know, images or um, you know, videos or songs, but literally every piece of media in the future, I believe is going to be incepted as an NFT, it will originate its life um, on chain. That's because the incentives are better for all the stakeholders involved. The creators can capture more value. Their audiences, who are generally the demand side of the market to buy these assets, um, have upside from being able to resell the assets that they, um, they buy and invest in. I'll talk about that more later. Um, and, and furthermore, developers are also able to build on top of this sort of open media library of assets that's being created on chain without having to ask anyone for permission, just like you can build with Bitcoin or Ethereum without fear of the network being rugged from underneath you um, because those platforms are decentralized and open. 
so too are our NFTs, um, as, as are all other crypto assets that live on these chains. And that's an exciting opportunity for developers. So the model serves all these stakeholders, creators, audiences, developers better than the Web2 model. And I think for those that reason, um, there'll be a lot of exciting market development here that results in NFTs being the port of entry for all internet media. And this idea that you can own a piece of the internet um, is one microcosm of a broader thesis on what crypto is unlocking. And this is the thesis for Variant, the fund that I, I run, um, and I call it the ownership economy thesis. And it's just the idea that crypto un has unlocked this new economic model where you can build networks that grow bigger, faster, because they are built, operated, and owned by their users. So ownership accelerates network effects um, because all the stakeholders involved have an incentive to grow the platforms or the products and services that they use every day because their success is aligned with the success of, of those products. And, th and that is true of NFTs, but it's also true of you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum in the early days, um, the developers and technologists that contributed to building and operating the network um, saw a lot of the upside by being able to earn an ownership stake. And you know, we see this playing out in increasingly more and more consumer facing verticals because like most emerging technologies, it starts with uh, you know, developers and technologists and eventually moves towards everyone else as the technology matures. NFTs are a really great example of the same ownership economy model crossing the chasm to, to mainstream consumers. Um, okay, so that's sort of the, the background. And now I'm gonna get into sort of what is happening out there in NFT world. Um, so we'll cover a, a, a ton of ground as, you know, as in as time efficient a manner as we can. Um, and so the, the first thing I'll talk about um, is the concept of patronage plus. And I, I sort of touched on this already, um, but, you know, patronage plus is the idea um, that you can simultaneously be a patron of creative work that you want to see on the internet um, but also profit from it. Um, and that is uniquely enabled by the ability to actually own something on the internet, right? So I really like the term, why subscribe when you can invest? That was coined, I think, by a friend, Jared Dicker. Um, you know, ownership isn't just buying something, it's investing in it, right? If you own an asset, um, it has the potential to appreciate or depreciate just like any other investment. Whereas subscribing to a newsletter is more like renting an apartment, right? You have nothing to show for it at the end of the day, other than the use of the thing while you subscribed. In contrast, owning an NFT is more like owning a home, you know, it can appreciate in value or depreciate. So, you know, while it's true in web two, when we subscribe to someone's Substack or someone's Patreon, we, you know, we, we tend to develop some kind of emotional stake in the, in the creator success or the project success. But until now, supporting a creator or project has never been tied to financial gain. You got nothing in return for it. What's cool about NFTs is that, you know, for, for the very first time, you know, a patron of a creator's work can have bragging rights to prove, hey, I was there first, but also gain financially as other, you know, audience members flock to, to come to know the creator's work um, and the demand for that work increases. So that's exciting for consumers, um, you know, who can be early and, and you know get the same feeling of being a patron supporting the work they want to see, but also benefit from the the possibility of profiting if the asset appreciates in value, and that's a very strong incentive to become a patron in the first place. So I think NFTs are going to explode the market for creator patronage on the internet because there are a lot of people who weren't probably weren't participating as patrons who now will jump in given the profit incentive to do so. Um, and today, this is, of course, happening with digital art. I'm sure many of you have seen the, the headlines of Beeple selling his first 5,000 days um, piece for $69 million earlier this year. Um, Cryptoart.io is a great resource, and, and it puts the total value of um, crypto art at $789 million. Um, but this is just digital art and, and NFTs unlock so much more than taking an image, a video or song and, and selling it as an NFT. Um, so 
beyond digital art, we're, we're seeing all kinds of cool patronage plus experiments running. So for example, um, Ethereum, the infinite garden is a documentary about, um, you know, the, the origin of Ethereum, the community around it. And by selling NFTs, um, on a platform called mirror, they raised over a thousand ETH, which is, is currently about three and a 3.3 million dollars, um, to, to actually fund the development of this film. Um, and so all contributors to this crowdfund received um, NFTs. There were tiers like you know, a Kickstarter campaign. But um, what's really exciting about this sort of mode of patronage is all the supporters are able to resell those NFTs. And so imagine if this film becomes you know, a, a, a cult success. Imagine owning one of the top tier NFTs for having backed it and, and being a, a, you know, an early patron. Someone might want, want to own that artifact as a, you know, a piece of the cultural canon, um, and the initial backer could profit from that. And so it's not just digital art; it's literally any creative project you can think of. Um, another example is the EIP one five five nine NFT series. So this is this is an open source project. EIP one five five nine was a is a uh, proposal that just recently came to pass to upgrade Ethereum's um, you know, fee mechanism. And there were lots of you know, open source contributors that, that, contr that uh, developed the code that was used. And again, using Mirror, the community crowdfunded um, a reward for, for those developers. The crowdfund was selling NFTs and the proceeds were donated um, to the, the open source contributors who made the, uh, you know, the open source commits happen. So NFTs and patronage plus more broadly are a really exciting way to fund creative work you want to see in the world, digital art, films, open source. Um, and one, one anecdote or thought experiment I'd like to talk about is the fact that Jack Dorsey, founder of Twitter, sold his first tweet ever, his hello world moment on Twitter as an NFT for $2 million earlier this year. But just like the open source project I, I talked about, I suspect the next Jack Dorsey, you know, the next founder of, of, of the next big platform will probably start their platform by virtue of selling NFTs to early supporters and using the proceeds to fund the development of the thing, just like um, these, these projects have done. So at the extreme, Patronage Plus is a new way to fund any creative project, including startups. Um, then there's stoner cats. <laughs> so a lot, a, a lot less serious, um, but also equally interesting. Stoner cats is, um, a new, uh, NFT series that went to fund uh, a TV show by the same name. And, you know, this has all-star Hollywood talent, Neil Kunis, Ashton Kutcher, Jane Fonda, Chris Rock, and none other than Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum. Um, the catch for this TV series is that the only way to watch the show is by is to own a stoner cat NFT, which functions as sort of a, you know, content pass like your Netflix account. Um, the sale of these cute cats brought in $8.4 million in less than one hour. Um, and the show benefited while, you know, be essentially being able to get funding without going through the traditional Hollywood studio bureaucracy and consumers benefited because the sale of these NFTs, um, you know, started at around $800 each, but secondary sales have appreciated to upwards of 70K per NFT. So the, the early supporters were able to realize um, profit from their participation in patronizing the show. Um, and then finally, the, the twist here, which we'll get into a little more later, is Neil Kunis went on to create a DAO whose membership is um, gated by access to owning one of these tokens. And the DAO is community members who participate in the sale and they get input into the show's development. Um, they get to decide on sort of plot twists and so on. So um, again, another, another great example of patronage plus in the realm of you know, Hollywood. Okay, so that's patronage plus. Uh, now I'm gonna move on. Like we talked about digital art a little bit, but I wanted to zoom in on one thing that's that's kind of surprising and, and really interesting that's happening, which is generative art on chain. So um, many, many of you may have heard the, the, the you know, phrase that um, my alma mater at A16Z coined that blockchains are a new kind of computer. You know, they run computer programs. One of the cool things that computers can do 
they can generate cool artwork. And um, a number of artists have been using blockchain computers to do exactly that. So generative art, what is it? It's, it's you know, algorithmic. Generally, it's attribute driven. So a, a developer writes in attributes of, of the art and the computer generates it. And then what, what we're seeing is communities form around um, an interest group, you know, in a, in a particular algorithm and try to compare their attributes. Um, so artists here are programmers. They don't create individual pieces. They just write the software that generates the art. Um, and in, in NFT world, artists can upload these algorithms into a smart contract that runs programmatically on Ethereum without the artist having to be involved. So a great example of this is Artblocks, which is probably the biggest and most successful on-chain generative art application. Um, and you know, we, we at Variant Fund actually early on commissioned a series by one of the artists in the community who created this series called Variant Plan for us. The artist's name is Jeff Davis. And we minted 200 of these and we gave them to you know, people who helped get Varian off the ground in, in the last year. Um, one of the other Artbox projects is, that, that's getting a lot of attention is called Chromy Squiggles. Um, the project contains 10,000 squiggly lines with variable colors, patterns, slopes, inflection points, at all these different attributes. And around this sort of uh, generative art, a community is formed, a DAO, um, that aims to sort of curate, offer grants, does you know does community gatherings um all around the shared interest of like this you know this aesthetic um that's programmatically generated and its unique attributes um and you know the it, kind of crazy thing is that one of these squiggles sold recently for 750 or about two and a half million dollars and only a year ago it was minted for 0 0.03 ETH. So, you know, generative art is really rapidly becoming part of the canon um, of, of sort of, you know, important art and, and I would argue crypto native art in that it uses smart contracts as its medium for expression. Um, okay, collectibles, that's another sort of exciting area. And, and, you know, these arguably are collectibles, but I think the slight diff here is that they are, you know, generative art collectibles. There are other kinds of collectibles though. Um, so of the most famous is of course, CryptoPunks. I'm sure you all have seen somebody with a CryptoPunks avatar. Um, this is a project released in 2017. So one of the first NFT projects, though, not the first, um, I think the, the first that I'm aware of, um, is rare Pepe's and that was actually on Bitcoin. Um, and that I think was back in 2015, but Larva Labs was the first, you know, significant NFT project on Ethereum. And they released um, 10,000 of these generative um, avatars. They, you know, unlike art blocks, the, the they were generated programmatically off chain, not using smart contracts. Um, each is unique, um, but certain are more desirable. They have certain traits, like you know, uh, aliens or zombies have red eyes. Um, some have hoodies, some have 3D glasses, and the community um, that's formed around these assets has done all kinds of analytics to sort of draw out these traits and just, you know, decide on which are the most valuable, which is obviously subjective, but, um, you know, quite objective now in the eyes of, of this community that's formed. And so while these were originally free to acquire, now the floor, the very cheapest one, um, sells for about $170,000. And often some of the more valuable ones um, sell in, in excess of, 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 you know, single digit millions, you know, I think seven, eight million or so is, is, is the highest one. And the total trading volume is over a billion dollars. Um, the, the thing that, you know, is important to note about CryptoPunks is they're very rapidly becoming a source of, you know, social status on the internet. So people have all kinds of social signaling, you know, status signaling offline, like a Chanel bag or whatever. People online are buying these, um, these CryptoPunks and making them their profile picture just to signal that you know they they have the wealth or status to do so, and that's you know that's kind of a new thing that you, you really kind of do um, before the primitive of being able to own something on the internet um, what was innately available to everyone. Um, Board Ape Board Ape Yacht Club is another project that sort of follows in the steps of CryptoPunks. 
Um, it brings the status component of CryptoPunks. So people are also using these as profile picks, um, but with the added benefit of access to a community that owns part of the universe that they're, um, that they're building together. So this, this project was launched in May of this year. They quickly sold out all of their ape avatars. Um, they have attracted you know, tons of attention from sports and, and celebrity figures who, who've rocked these avatars as their profile pictures. But owning one of these apes gates access to um, this sort of hangout, which is a virtual space. The first sort of um, you know, represent or experience around the apes is called the bathroom, which has a canvas that ape holders can contribute to scribbling on the wall of you can you can like draw on the wall of the bathroom in this um this this yacht club so it's social status in the form of a profile pic and being in a sort of members only social club um and then the most recent of these drops pudgy penguins frankly i haven't gotten up to speed on this one but it's just indicative of how much the social signaling and, and identity is you know growing and, and at, at a rapid clip. This project's only one month old, um, but these prices, these you know, cute little penguins are selling for a couple of thousand dollars each. And you know, there are drops like this happening every single day. 10,000 series profile picks are you know left, right, and center. So it does beg the question, you know, which of these projects is going to stick? Which of these like communities that are buying these NFTs are going to be around long term, and I, I have this tweet up here. Um, I think that you know, like ICOs in 2017, much of what's happening in NFT world um, is is frothy right now. There's lots of projects dropping, lots of pro you know token NFTs selling really for eye popping amounts, and and people flipping those NFTs. But that's not to say that they will all prove faddish. I think what's um, what's notable about NFTs is that the strong communities. Um, or the strongest projects do form organic communities around them. Um, and those communities are incentivized to reinvent themselves and, you know, pre prevent them from sort of becoming a fad because the members of these communities have a direct incentive um, to create value around the assets that they own. And so I would willing to bet that internet communities that own their outcomes will be much better at reinventing cool over time than you know, traditional companies that maybe had a faddish craze like Beanie Babies or Pogs or other kinds of collectibles. I do think that the success case for these, um, these digital collectibles is something more like a social network where the members um, who own these assets you know, pool resources and build cool stuff together that is aligned with the interest group of the community. Um, and one, one example of a really healthy community that's formed around, um, around NFTs is um, Blipmap and SupDrive, which is a sort of ancillary project. So Blipmap is a community crafted sci-fi fantasy universe that is all centered around um, a series of NFTs that the community created together. It's part sort of generative art, part um, you know traditional art in that there are, um, uh, canvases with limited pixels that the community can remix. So there's, there's, you know, working within the constraints of a smart contract is the sort of generative piece. Um, but then the, the creative side of it is that community members are able to use those pixels to create their own works. Um, and, you know, what, what's happening is the community is taking um, the initiative to, to build all kinds of cool experiments around these NFTs that they own. So for example, someone burned their blip map and airdropped a newly creative ERC20 token that was a result of the burn to all the other blip map holders in the community to introduce a bit of chaos quote to the to the blip verse. Um, and you know they're now also working on Subdrive, which is a new sort of gaming platform where each NFT will be a playable original video game built around the, the blip map universe. So it's an example of a community forming around this shared interest and building stuff together. And I think that will have longevity over time versus the you know, quick hype cycles that many of these other projects are, are going through. Okay, moving on. Um, another very exciting category in, in NFTs is gaming and specifically play to earn gaming. So remember at the beginning of the presentation when we said, why rent when you can own or why subscribe when you can invest? Well, the same thing goes for gaming. Why play 
for free when you can play to earn or play to own. Um, so yeah, don't just play games, play to own, play to earn. Perhaps the best example of this is Axie Infinity, which is an NFT based video game, sort of best defined as a Pokemon inspired universe uh, where anyone can earn tokens through gameplay and contribute to the ecosystem. So players battle, they collect, they raise these axes, which are these little guys on the screen here. Um, and in so doing, they build this sort of land-based world or kingdom, I think it's called, for their axi pets. Um, so just to unpack that a bit, players own the assets um, and help build the world around those assets that give those, um, those assets context and value in the context of the gameplay. Um, so this project gained a ton of recognition during COVID when large numbers of people in the Philippines and Vietnam began quitting their jobs or, you know, replacing the jobs that they lost um, to play Axie Infinity because it was actually more lucrative than their jobs were. They were playing the game, earning these, um, these, these assets and selling them to new players um, in order to, you know, replace their income. And so, um, the, the stats here are pretty staggering. Recently, Axie crossed a billion in secondary market sales. That's a billion dollars in, in you know, Axie digital assets. Um, and that's, they are the first sort of play to earn game to do so. And their daily active users grew from 108,000 in just June of this year to over a million today. So, you know, 10X very, very quickly in the last few months. Um, and, and I think the, they're doing something close to $200 million in 30 day revenue again, trading, trading these assets. So proof in the pudding that adding ownership and making ownership a keystone of a product experience in, in, you know, in the context of gaming is a very you know, direct way to grow network effects, grow products and services bigger, faster than our Web2 models. Another example, oh, sorry, you, you know, just continuing with, on the Axie train, one of the sort of things that's popped up out of the Axie community is Yield Guild games. So, you know, with Axie, players need to own a set of Axies to play the game, but the price of them can easily be a few hundred dollars. And, and a lot of folks in the Philippines and Vietnam can't afford that. So Yield Guild games was founded to solve that problem. Um, the idea at its core is that, you know, Yield Guild lends out Axies to players who couldn't afford them and shares in the profit that they make um, from playing the game. So community managers help to introduce new players to crypto and they also receive a cut. And this is an example of the community, you know, being incentivized to grow the community and get new people involved because they're financially aligned with doing so. Um, some quick stats, there's been over 5,000 scholars which are recipients of, of um, these lent out axes and over $8.6 million earned um, by the players in this program. Um, Zed Run is another play to earn game, very similar to Axie in, in many of the dynamics. It's horse racing. You can buy, you can sell and breed and race these horses. Each horse is unique. It has different attributes, just like the art blocks, generative artworks. You know, there's, there's like different bloodlines and genotypes, um, different coats that can affect the performance of the horse in the race. Owners pay an entry fee to enter a race, just like in, you know, in, in real world horse racing, and they compete for prize money. Um, and so this is just, you know, just like owning a horse in the physical world, you can, you can earn, um, you can now do that digitally and, um, you know, really benefit from the economy that's, that's sort of building around these. So um, the, the cool thing that's worth noting, you know, obviously you could have a game like this without crypto, but the thing that's, very different is when players actually own their assets, they're incentivized to make sure that the world built around those assets continues to get better and better. So many of the community members are you know, participating in improving the gameplay um, and in order to you know, see that these horses have more utility. And, and that's what, again, why these worlds potentially can grow bigger faster because it's not just one game developer working um, to, to sort of increase the utility, it's the whole community of owners doing so. Another exciting trend that's happening in NFTs is fractionalization. So up till now, we've talked about owning a whole NFT, but we're going to now discuss what happens when we can break them into pieces and why is that desirable? So first, how does it work? Um, 
an NFT is locked into a smart contract. A whole NFT is locked into a smart contract. Um, ERC-721 is the, on Ethereum the, the standard uh, for NFTs. It's a schema that describes the NFT. And that ERC-721 is then fractionalized into ERC-20 tokens, which are fungible tokens. Um, and then each shareholder's possession um, of their ERC-20 token entitles them to you know, a, a share in the NFT. Um, so for example, I buy a punk for $100, lock it in a contract and mint 100 punk tokens. I retain 50 and, and then my friend buys 50 and now we each own half a punk. Um, so projects like fractional.art are super exciting because they allow for um, you know, anyone to gain access to exposure of a digital media asset or an NFT. Um, you know, users can fractionalize entire collections as a basket. Um, so you can create like an ETF of CryptoPunks or, or Z horses. Um, or you know, you can enable someone who can't afford an entire punk to, to own one share of, of it. Um, and you know, this happens in the traditional art world. Like it is possible to buy into a you know an art hedge fund where you know a Picasso is stored somewhere um, in like a cold storage room that no one can see it in, but you own a share. This is a lot more exciting. In, you know, fractionalizing um, digital work is a lot more exciting because everyone can see the piece online. Um, you don't have to trust that the asset is stored in some cold storage room and, and it's protected because you can see it in a smart contract on the blockchain. Um, and yet anyone can gain exposure or ownership um, in that work, no matter how expensive it is, because these fractions are infinitely divisible. Um, so that, that that's pretty exciting um, because it allows for you know, broader communities to form around these assets, irrespective of their price and, and just form around the interest. Um, so why, why, you know, why fractionalization matters? I, I talked about the democratization just now, but also liquidity is another important reason why fractionalization matters. Um, it's hard sometimes to sell a unique NFT because how do you find a buyer given this, rare, you know, this thing is rare and you know, centered around interest groups, it's very different than uh, you know, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or Ethereum, which trades in very liquid markets. With fractional tokens, you can create much more liquid markets around an asset because it's possible to trade in and out um, without having to find a single buyer uh, who wants to take the whole thing. Um, it's also useful for price discovery for, for the same reason. Instead of getting you know, one bid from one potential buyer, um, you have these much more liquid markets that help aid in, um, in, in discovering a price for the underlying asset. Um, and finally, I touched on this earlier, but because more people can participate, it's a lot easier to grow the communities around these assets um, if they're fractionalized because anyone with any amount of money can, can buy in and, and um, you know, become a part of the ownership community that, um, that exists around the interest group. Um, and that, that brings me to, I think, the final section. And this is a lot, and I'll open up to questions soon. Um, and that is the idea that you know, social investing is you know, nigh or, or happening right now. So investing, I think, is very much becoming a team sport. We saw it with Wall Street bets, and, and we're starting to see it now with NFTs. Um, so just you know, running with this idea that fractionalization opens up um, ownership to, to anyone, no matter how much money you have, um, and enables you to join a community. You know, you are invested in that community because you own a piece of it. And now you're on the team of other investors who've done the same. Um, so one of the cool things that we're seeing along this theme of investing as a team sport is group bidding and buyouts of NFTs. So, um, you know, just, just as fractionalization allows for ownership of one NFT by multiple group buyouts allow for the purchase of one NFT by multiple people. Um, and, and I'm talking about purchase from, from first principles rather than, you know, buying into the, um, the asset after it's been fractionalized. This allows you to a group to buy a whole NFT that has not been fractionalized. And this is really cool for a few reasons. One, first, collective bidding is truly community driven from the start. It's people pooling resources together in order to win an asset. And one, one cool example of this um, 
is an experiment we ran, we ran around um, blip maps. There was this piece representing all of the blip map artworks that the community created. Um, and we created a party bid, which is, you know, partybid.app is, is, the, is the application where anyone could, you know, come in alongside variant fund to buy this piece um, from the creators of the project. And it ended up raising, I think, well over uh, 200K. Um, and this group of people that pulled resources won the auction against uh, a, a few other bidders who were, who were bidding independently. Um, and, and you know, another example of the same idea is um, you know, Edward, Edward Snowden created an NFT um, that sold for a few million dollars. And um, it didn't sell to a single buyer, but rather a group of people who pooled resources um, in order to make that NFT you know, co-owned by a community that shared the values that, you know, that the piece espoused. Um, so this is a really exciting, I think, sort of phenomenon where it's, you know, sort of groups of people pooling resources on the internet to, to buy cool internet shit that they love. Um, and, and, you know, that's only one hop to um, forming a, a sort of a DAO or an interest group that continues to build stuff together beyond just buying a single NFT. Um, and some examples of this are these collector DAOs, which have formed to do exactly that. Pleaser, Pleaser DAO is one of the better known. I think that that's the um, group that acquired the Edward Snowden piece. Fingerprints DAO is a sort of investing club that's specifically focused on generative art. So you're starting to see all these really niche interest groups pool resources and do things together that no individual member could do on their own. That's exciting. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, you have creator DAOs. So instead of you know, the, the demand side of the market pooling resources, you have creators soliciting um, you know, resources from their fans in order to create work with, with their audience. Um, one of the coolest examples of this is this project called Holly Plus. Uh, Holly Herndon is, is sort of a, a really interesting musician who works with software a lot in her, in her practice of writing music. She's an yeah, experimental musician um, and, and, and computer science um, you know, person. And she, this Holly Plus project is a digital twin where anyone can make music with her voice so long as they own a token, an NFT, um, that makes them part of the creator DAO. Um, so, you know, it works both ways. Creators, you know, building communities by virtue of their audience buying their work and, and then creators making work with their audience by virtue of their audience, um, the audience buying in to their, um, their sort of creative process uh, and, and funding their work. Um, and finally, what, what I'm calling patronage plus DAOs, which are, are sort of um, DAOs that form without a specific purpose in mind. You know, they don't form to buy a specific NFT or you know create um, media together. They just pool resources um, by buying NFTs with hopes of you know something emergent forming. And the best example of this running right now, something called called Nouns DAO, where they sell an NFT, a generative NFT, every day. One is auctioned every 24 hours forever, and 100% of the proceeds are sent to the DAO um, whose membership is constituted by the um, people who purchase the NFTs. And those people can govern what happens with the treasury. So it's an experiment in what you know, the internet can build together by pooling resources where ownership over whatever is built is denominated in NFTs. So to sum all this up, what, what do I think is happening here? Um, you know, I think this is the big idea. These are on-chain investment clubs. These are funds, people pooling resources. And I think they're the future of tech, of media, of celebrity, of culture, because they will start to dictate what gets paid attention to on the internet. It's no longer gonna be, you know, what does the algorithm prioritize? It's going to be who owns a piece of this idea, of this work. If you have a large distribution, an internet scale community bought in to a piece of art, a piece of software that's been funded by the community and represented as an NFT, that's what's gonna dictate what gets paid attention to because you'll have billions of people invested in the success of the thing. So you can start to see you know, inklings of that in the NFT market. If you have a you know, collector DAO 
buying a specific artwork and there's a million members in that DAO, you know, those million members are going to be paying attention to that creator, paying attention to that artwork. Now imagine there's billions of people in a given DAO. That's that's going to start to dictate where people are are spending their, you know, their their scarce attention. So yeah, that may be a good place to pause. Yeah. And with that, I'll open up to questions. Awesome. That was definitely <laughs> very thorough. So thank you, Jesse. Um, so whoever has questions, just raise your hand and then we'll just go in order. Um, Carlos, you had your hand up for a while. So start there. Hey, Jesse, thanks for the talk. Just a kind of broader question on the overall market. Um, I'm very pro NFT, obviously, but just curious on hear your thoughts about like, how much of the NFT craze has been happening because people are kind of locked up with COVID and locked in the house. And a lot of people are moving to digital first social experiences and just what you expect the near future might be given things are going to open back up. Yeah. I, I mean, I, so I think, you know, it's, it's probably true that, you know, people are spending more time online than, than they used to, but I don't think that's, you know, that, that in, in the long arc of time, that's always going to be true. I think, you know, that our, we're living more and more of our lives online and COVID only accelerated that. So, you know, while there may be some short-term correction, like most markets are cyclical long run, I think the trend is, is very steady. Thank you, it was a great talk. So a lot of the things that you mentioned, and it seems to me like there's a lot of overlap between what the ERC20 tokens also do. So where do you see that there is similarities and differences? Like what are the areas of overlap? For example, the governance tokens, the fractional art, and then the backing and the long-term investment. Wouldn't token be a better mode in those situations? What are the areas where you think there are similarities and differences? Yeah, Would I think it's a great question. So I, just to restate, I think to make sure I'm interpreting correctly, we're asking like, what is the what are the some of the key differences between NFTs and fungible tokens like you see in DeFi, right? Um, it's true, you know, in, in many of the projects we discussed, like where NFTs are being used for governance, for membership in DAOs. Um, the primary difference, of course, is that these tokens are unique. They're different from one another. They have different attributes. And so I think what, you know, what I would speculate to say is that those communities are more interest based, right? Whereas fungible token communities are more, you know, financially driven. Um, the, the in, I say they're interest-based because the people that own them, you know, maybe bought the unique thing that they own because they're interested in it, right? They think it's cool. Um, and so it provides sort of a very different foundation for a community-owned network than a, you know, a community that's primarily driven by financial returns. Um, I think that's the baseline difference that there are others, um, you know, I'll, I, I should note, like, one thing that can be different about NFTs is the fact that they are programmable, right? So it, it could be the case that you program some function into your governance where only hoodie punks can vote on certain things, right? And that's one you know, benefit of the sort of playing into the uniqueness of these assets that you can't do with fungible tokens, for example. So yeah, that, that's I, I, just, just to wrap, you know, really hammer it home and wrap it up. I think they're there's sort of a sort of a difference in kind in the communities, um, you know, between NFT token communities and, and fungible token communities. Cool, Thank Victor. You. I think you have a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a great talk. I, I've learned a lot more about the NFT since. Um, my question is more related about the idea of flipping. So. I think a lot of my friends and like the the media coverage has been around NFTs and the idea of like a you buy it for $5 and then you flip it off for like $100 kind of idea. And that's where a lot of the uh, frenzy has been. Mm -hmm. um, when when you talk about like interest-based or like at, like maybe transferring it to more like an investable asset, where does the like idea of like how you can use an NFT to generate returns versus just like flipping it, if that makes sense. Since like a lot of the times when people buy the, the asset, it feels more like they're either trying to do it as a status symbol, they're either trying to like buy it low and hope that like some interest community will then buy it off of them for like $100 or like 10x, 20x versus um, kind of like something which in the chat right now just say like a royalty, like an NFT royalty kind of actually helping the, the person who created the creative content like gain from it. So I'm just yeah. curious on your thoughts on like, 
where that that is going like right now it's just still to me seems a little bit more like flipping versus just like a place yeah. where you can kind of generate returns over time and invest in it but yeah, i'm just curious on your thoughts on that sure so i think i think it's worth drawing analogy to the sort of ico craze in, in 2017 where certainly there was a lot of flipping going on around fungible tokens um, and of course, you know, many, many of the tokens uh, being flipped didn't really have any utility. There, there were really no users. And eventually that market kind of petered out when there was no one to flip to. Um, and I think, you know, something similar is happening in NFTs right now. You know, there's, there's all these drops, you know, that are more or less sort of copy pasta versions of, of one another. Um, and there is a lot of flipping and, and, you know, rampant speculation going on, no doubt. However, you know, as, as hopefully came across in, in this presentation, there are also a lot of really interesting projects being built and communities being formed around these assets where the, the, the people involved are long-term holders. There is sort of real utility being built, whether it's games or sort of, you know, just an interest group around a specific kind of art. Um, and those communities are pooling resources and building cool stuff together. So just like ICOs were sort of written off as just nothing more than speculation, but here we are today with a ton of utility in DeFi and, and, and more emergent categories um, where those, you know, those, those applications are coordinated by governance tokens or fungible tokens. I think the same is going to happen with NFT is where, you know, we'll, we'll get through this speculative phase in the market where there's lots of flipping going on. There will be some sort of correction, but there will also be projects that, you know, build really healthy communities and real utility around the assets and preserve, um, you know, value for the, the contributors who, who stuck it out. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I think the, the gaming ones probably right now uh, make the most sense to me, but interested to see where other communities come up. Cool. Yeah, so my question is, uh, since blockchain doesn't have a concept of ID password, uh, we have this MetaMask, which kind of does the signing for you through your private key, right? Uh, and most of the famous projects that we're seeing are still on the browser base. Like we don't have a mobile app for a lot of them. Like, are you aware of any projects that try to solve this issue? Yeah, I, so I, I think it's, it's a great point. Um, I think there is a real big opportunity right now in, in the market to build an amazing, you know, mobile first experience around NFTs. Um, I think the best in, in class right now is probably Rainbow Wallet. Um, so it's, if you don't have it installed on your phone, um, do, you know, check it out. It's, um, it, it's just, you know, got a great sort of visualization of, of like, you know, the stuff in your wallet. And my, my view is, you know, when, when you think of the wallet in your pocket or in your purse, you know, you have your identity in there, you have your money in there, you have all your cards, you know, you have access to your stuff. And a digital wallet should be the same, like you should open it up and all your stuff should be there. And you should be able to quickly and easily like access it. And so one of the functions I think of a, of a wallet on your phone is visualizing the NFTs, many of which are visual assets and, and currently MetaMask and other browser wallets don't do a great job of that. So I think it's, it's a big opportunity. Thank you. Anthony, go for it. Yeah. So are there any like exciting projects where NFTs and DeFi are working together? Like Yeah, I mean I think I think fractionalization is is sort of the 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 first and maybe like biggest example where you know fractionalization is financialization of an asset. You're taking an asset that's, you know, one of a kind, generally illiquid, has a hard time with price discovery. And you're fractionalizing it, which aids with all those things. And, and, and the aid is the financialization of the asset. Um, so that's that's one example. There's there's all kinds of other stuff happening at the intersection. For example, there's lots of people working on lending markets. So being able to lend against your crypto punk and, and uh, or sorry, borrow against it. Um, and and the, obviously the key problem to solve there again is, is you know, a price assessment or, um, you know, the valuation of the asset. Uh, as collateral. Um, so there's lots of different, you know, approaches to trying to solve that problem. Um, but, you know, it's important to note, you know, coming back to, to one of my slides earlier, that, you know, NFTs are not just, you know, for digital media, it's literally every piece of media or every file on the internet will be incepted as an NFT. I think, you know, we'll have other kinds of non-fungible assets represented as NFTs 
houses, you know, property rights, et cetera. All that stuff will eventually come on chain. Today, I think the, the most exciting areas are digitally native, um, you know, rare assets or unique assets. And generally those are media assets because computers are good at information transfer, not land transfer. Um, but, you know, long run, yeah, I think we'll have all kinds of, of you know, non-fungible assets represented as NFTs and the DeFi rails that are being built will facilitate all kinds of financial transactions around them. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Jesse. There's a question on top of the Anthony's question. So like in the real estate market, we have REIT, right, which is the index fund for instead of buying uh, only individual ones. Do you have something similar like a REIT uh, for the NFT market today? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So I think, you know, I can't name one off the bat that I think is is like, you know, the best index of, of what's happening in NFTs, but certainly it's going to emerge if it doesn't already exist and, and maybe I don't know about it. And it will emerge, I think, through fractionalization, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you have um, fractional, uh, a fractional crypto punk and a fractional Zed horse and a fractional, you know, art blocks uh, piece on fractional.art, someone can take those fractions and pull them together into, um, you know, into a smart contract and mint a token that represents ownership of that basket. Um, right. so, so certainly, um, you know, this product must exist and that I just don't know, you know, who's building it. Um, but that, you know, that'll be a great way and probably the way many people get exposure to this new asset class. Okay. Thank you. Great. I think that, summed up all of the questions. I, don't, I had one uh, more philosophical thing. Um, I mean, with NFTs now, you know, things that previously did not have value can have value, right? Um, and it's seemingly like anything random can all of a sudden have value if we all agree as value. How do you think that inflates our perception of like just value in general? Yeah, it's, that's a really interesting question. So I think Hmm. Let me try to answer it this way. I think what we're seeing is um, just, you know, just like the internet made like long tail interest groups possible in a way that wasn't, you know, feasible before you could move value at zero cost, all the, or sort of move information at zero cost. We can now have sort of, you know, interest groups form around values where, where values should be defined in sort of a pluralistic way, right? So like we compared fungible tokens to non-fungible tokens, you know, fungible tokens are more financial value and non-fungible tokens are more interest-based value and it's okay for them to coexist. That's, that's been hard, um, yeah. you know, in traditional markets because the cost to move information and coordinate interest groups um, was not applied to money. Right. Um, but now you can financialize all kinds of other values um, and let people interested in those other kinds of values buy into them with financial value. And that's that's pretty exciting um, because it's just not been possible to experiment with it. But before this, you know, it became software. I also wonder, though, if like I mean, sometimes the reason art is awesome is because it wasn't financialized. Right. That's it's true. like. It's like now that we're attaching money to it, um, I don't know, it changes art. <laughs> That's true. It I think I, I, I definitely agree that just more broadly, like culture, you yeah. know, the financialization of culture um, is accelerated by this phenomenon and that's going to have implications, both, both good and bad, yeah. but I'm willing to bet that, um, that it's net good in that it creates, um, you know, it creates opportunity for people who couldn't participate in making cool things to, to do so. Um, and, and I think that's gonna be net positive. Yeah, awesome. All right, thanks, Jesse. I know we just made it on time, so really appreciate it. It was definitely a full gamut. I don't know if you're open to sharing the slides, but um, I, I bet a few people here would love to see that. Yeah, um, definitely. I'll post them and I'll share them with you. Awesome, um, but yeah, this, this was fun to put together and hope you guys enjoyed. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, gave us a lot to think about. So thanks again. And uh, awesome. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye.